much. Kevin Corla, I agree this is a very important debate, and I think it's something uh, here which the Minister has said which I think holds true, and it is an absolute condemnation on all sides, Minister, as in your speech, to anybody who commits arson, and in particular the fact that uh, what you say in your speech, and it's an important point to press home, uh, that if a group of people break into a premises and set it on fire, it doesn't matter who actually lit that match, all potentially face the charge of arson. And they can get a maximum of up to 10 years in jail for doing so. And I think the, the reality is that I know the Gardaí have appointed a special Gardaí to investigate each and every one of these awful, evil criminal acts. And I welcome that. I also welcome the fact that you will have people before the courts uh, in terms of the rights in Dublin, which I think is very important as well, that they get salutary and, and uh, long sentences. And I think this debate comes, and I want to, admit, to say what I believe in, and I come from a family, my brother, Neil has worked in America for many years, working for the people that, that our deputy there spoke about. Uh, he's worked very hard to make sure that the Irish in America are treated properly and that immigration and Irish immigration reform was appropriately and properly handled. And I fully support that here as well. And I think if we want to draw a historic parallel to the people who are burning premises and opposing uh, new, new people coming into our country. It's the No Nothing movement in America in the 1850s where uh, they were opposed to and they combated, in their view, foreign influence and uphold and promoted traditional ways of life. And the fact that was the American way of life and what they were virulently anti-Catholic and very much anti-German Catholics and Irish immigrants as well. So that was a movement then 1850, and today we have the same xenophobia. We have appalling acts being carried out, and we also have, I believe, very offensive language being used. Uh, it, it, you know, it, targeting people who are of a different religion to the Christian religion, uh, who, who have different mores and customs, who are different colours to, to, to most people in this house. So I think it's hugely important that we balance this debate and we say exactly what we think and that we try and get an outcome which is acceptable to everybody. So it's been a very difficult situation in Drogheda, and I know that all political parties in Drogheda uh, are basically of, of, of the one mind, that the decision to remove the only hotel that was in occupation in our town, to take it out of the public domain, was a bad decision. It was an arrogant decision. It showed no empathy and it should no understanding of the commercial and other needs in a community that is and continues to play its part in meeting the needs of new residents or international protection applicants and Ukrainians in our town. And it's very important that the action of the minister, which I believe was high-handed without consultation, resulted in a group of people, members of, I think, the Irish Freedom Party, uh, having a, a, an event in Drogheda which nobody in Drogheda, thankfully, was prepared to stand up and talk at. And that is an important point. They called for people uh, from Drogheda to speak at their, at, their, at, their, at their march, and nobody took that microphone. So I think it's very important to distinguish between people who support proper and full integration in our society, but at the same time, separately and differently, have a significant objection to losing the only hotel that they have. Now, Drogheda is the largest town in Ireland. As I understand it, the Chamber of Commerce has said that the occupancy rate in the D Hotel was 86%. That's, that's in the public statement. So this was an active hotel fully in use. And there is no other hotel in walking distance in the town. Uh, that, that, there's no other hotel there because they're also used for, 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 um, for, you know, to, to house Ukrainians and other refugees, apart from Scholars Hotel, which I think is something around 16 bedrooms. Now, there are a number of small hotels on the periphery of the town, none of them within walking distance. So as a result of the cack-handed actions of the minister, there is nowhere in Drogheda uh, 
that people can stay overnight effectively. And our tourism industry, which has been very heavily invested in by this government, is at nil in terms of people who want to stay overnight. And if people, family members come to stay, if there's a funeral, and they come back from America or England or abroad, there's no hotel from them. And that is at the heart of the objection in Drogheda. And it's very important that I clearly say that here. Because I'm someone who has stood up for the abuse, as the, the uh, Minister Gorman knows, the abuse of Ukrainians, where, been, where they were being exploited in our town. I stood on their side, and I will continue to work and support them. So I think that the Minister Gorman needs to think again. He needs to go back uh, to the premise of what is democracy. Democracy is about consulting. It's not about telling people what you're going to do. It's not about giving you an hour's notice that your hotel is gone. It's when you're making such a major decision, uh, uh, a, a, an experienced politician will say, well, let's, let's think this through again. Let's talk to the Chamber of Commerce. Let's talk to the business interests. Uh, let's identify you know, what is the impact in this in terms of economic impact, in terms of tourism and so on. And that did not and has not happened in Drogheda to date. But I do note, Minister, that your good self and the Taoiseach and Minister Heather Humphreys and Minister Gorman are meeting and discussing these issues again. I think it's important that we can find a way forward that does the two things. Uh, welcomes our migrants into the town. And secondly, make sure that we don't lose our only hotel. And I think that's the conundrum that has to be faced and has to be dealt with. And I feel that uh, in terms of the Ukrainians in particular, um, I, I think that they make a huge uh, and important contribution to our economy. I think there's over 16,000 people, mainly females, who are working in our, in our cafes, in our towns, and in our, in our, in our shops, and in, in our garages, or wherever. And they're very, very welcome. They make a very significant contribution. And in terms of rural areas where schools are down in numbers, they can make the difference and make sure that, that, the, that schools, particularly primary schools, are viable into the future. They bring a new vibrancy. They're, they're bringing new life into our communities. And it's very, very welcome indeed. So I think the key thing is, is to accentuate and support the people who are entitled to be here. And Minister, I agree with the firm process. If somebody is coming here from a country that is deemed safe, and uh, that, that if they are from a safe country and there are no other issues in relation to uh, abuse and all of the other rape and you know, female gentle, um, uh, and so on, um, that, 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 that they are sent back to their country if it is a safe place. And there's no danger if that person is on the plane because if, they're, if the country is appropriate and is deemed to be safe, then there's no issue. Obviously, if you're sending somebody back to Afghanistan, uh, that's a different ballgame altogether. And I understand why governments might be reluctant to send people back to countries where, where there's a Taliban in place and they're likely uh, to be executed as a result of, of, of going back there. So I think we need a balance in this debate. And I think, Minister, it might be useful if the uh, European Union, I know they've discussed this, uh, if, they, if they would try and get an agreement among all, all EU countries that there would be a full list of safe countries and that that should be, I believe, the same for every European country. In other words, if you're from any of these countries, uh, and if they're safe, well then, there isn't a place for you here. And that's the reality. The other issue I'd like to address is when we have shortages in our economy of skilled labour and so on. And if we have people living in this country um, and we're assessing their applications for, for, for permission to stay, I personally uh, would, have a, would, have a, would have support for a policy. If they have skills, if they're carpenters, if they're if they have building skills, if they have education skills, if they have, if they have skills that we need and we have a shortage of. I say, well, why don't we specifically in those cases say, yes, you, you can stay here because you're going to add to our economy, you're going to build the houses that we need and you're going to make a significant difference. And it is a fact, Minister, that 
I think it's one in every four, sorry, 20% of our population are people who weren't born in Ireland. That's 20% of all residents. That's a very significant number. And it's something we need. We need people in this House and in the Senate from those communities to be elected and to represent those views here. We need people of all religions in here. And I think the Senate, if, if people stand for election, you know, it, it's, it's a look at the draw whether you're elected or not. But there's no doubt about it. There is a significant need for representatives of those communities and those other languages and religions um, to be in the Shannon at the very least. But I'd like to see them in this house. And I know that in our own constituency, I'm sure in yours, we have people of different religions and different backgrounds standing for election. And I hope they'll be elected in, in the next uh, local election. So things are changing, they're changing on the ground. Ireland is a different place. It's multicultural, it's multiracial. And it's, it's uh, you know, driving up here today, you know, I just saw how vibrant our economy still is that, you know, at, at seven o'clock in the morning, our roads are crowded with people going to work. Our trains are full. There's lots of good things happening here. It's, it's a safe place for people who need to come here and are fleeing persecution. And, and long may that be that way. But nevertheless, the reality is the Irish Times poll yesterday showed that 22% of people asked, what is the most important issue in your community? 22% of them said immigration. They deem it to be more important in the month of February than housing and everything else. So there is an issue here. And it's the issue of, of talking to people. People object when they don't know the truth, when they don't know the facts. You know, when a town loses its only hotel that's viable, that's not acceptable. And if the minister learns that lesson, uh, you know, he will have learned, you know, that, that, that Drogheda, the Drogheda is very angry at what he's done. And I know that he is meeting us again and hopefully he'll have an answer. But don't, don't confuse, Minister Gorman, the difference between losing your hotel and not welcoming new people into the community. Because uh, people are and do welcome them. And I, and I go back again, you know, to draw the, like, you know, we have a huge immigrant population with our, with our hospital there. Over 2,500 people work in the Lord's Hospital in Drogheda. Must be the biggest, one of the biggest employers in the country. Uh, so, and there's many people from many cultures uh, and many religions in that hospital and, and no religion as well. So, you know, we are a vibrant, welcoming community and we'll always be. But we want a res resolution to our hotel problem. Thank you, Concord.